starting with number 10 all the way down to number 1. Sikhism is the world's fifth largest religion. The religion was founded by Guru Nanak and it's based on his teachings and the teachings of nine other Sikh gurus who followed him. Guru Nanak was born in 1469 in what is now Pakistan. At the age of 30, he disappeared for three days. And when he reappeared, he began to preach the Sikh faith and he spent the rest of his life teaching, writing, and traveling around the world to discuss religion with Muslims and Hindus. Guru Nanak has been called one of the greatest religious innovators of all time. So the next fact about Sikhism that I want to look at is there are 10 gurus in the Sikh faith, of course including Guru Nanak, the founder of Sikhism. The other gurus are Guru Angad, Guru Amar Das, Guru Ram Das, Guru Arjan Dev, Guru Har Gobind, Guru Har Rai, Guru Har Krishna, Guru Teg Bahadar and Guru Gobind Singh who was the last human guru. Another non-human guru exists but I'll get to that in a bit so keep on watching. The universal symbol of Sikhism is the Khanda and it's the double edged sword flanked by two daggers and this represents worldly and spiritual powers bound by the oneness of God. Also the Sikh scripture is a book called the Guru Granth Sahib. The book is a collection of teachings teachings and general guidelines for how Sikhs should live their lives. The book is by Guru Nanak as well as the other gurus. The scriptures are written in the Punjabi language and are greatly respected by Sikhs all over the world. You'll find that when you visit a Gurdwara which is a place of worship for the Sikhs, the holy book is kept on a raised platform and it's covered. The Sikhs take their shoes off in the presence of the holy book as well as at every major Sikh festival they read the book all the way through through, which takes them around 48 hours. Another fact about the holy book is so the 10th guru Gobind Singh as the last guru of the Sikhs in human form he appointed the sacred Adi Granth meaning the first book to be his successor so that after him there would be no more human gurus. The Adi Granth is usually called the Guru Granth Sahib as I just mentioned in recognition that it's the embodiment of the guru. He also created the Kal which is a spiritual brotherhood and sisterhood devoted to purity of thought and action. He gave the Khalsa a distinctive external form to remind them of their commitment and to help them maintain an elevated state of consciousness. Halfway in, as I mentioned, the community of men and women who have been initiated into the Sikh faith is known as the Khalsa, which means community of the pure. In order to become a Sikh and join the Khalsa, people need to follow the five Ks. And let me spell them out for you. There's Kesh, meaning you must have uncut hair as a mark of holiness and submission to God's will. Then there's the Kanga, and that's the name of a small wooden comb in the hair as a sign of cleanliness. There's also Ka which is a steel bracelet which is a reminder that a Sikh is connected to God. Then the Kachera is the short cotton underwear and the Kirpan you gotta keep this sword for your protection. Another important fact is that anywhere the Guru Granth Sahib is kept is a Sikh place of worship. Now this could be a separate building altogether or just a room. It's called a Gudwara meaning the gateway to the Guru. Sikh services are generally held on Sundays and they are are based on the writings of the Guru Granth Sahib together with chanting and prayers from the gurus known as Kirtan. There are also four doors into a Gurdwara and they're known as the door of peace, the door of livelihood, the door of learning and the door of grace. These doors are a symbol that people from all four points of the compass all around the world are welcome and that members of all castes are equally welcome. There's always a light on in a Gurdwara to show that the gurus light is always visible and accessible to everyone at any time. The purpose of the doors is to symbolize the openness of the Sikhs towards all people from all different backgrounds, all races, all cultures, and all religions. Now the second last fact I want to share is the concept of God. So it's completely different in Sikhism than other mainstream religions. God is known as Ik Ankar or One Constant. It's found in the Gurmurki scripture that God has no gender in Sikhism although translations may depict a male god. 
It's also referred to as Akal Perk, which means beyond time and space, and referred to as Nirankar, which means without form. It's kind of trippy to hear God being referred to as it, though, because normally we hear God being described using he or him. And the final fact I want to share in this episode about Sikhism is that the central Sikh shrine is the Harmandir Sahib, located in Amritsar, India, which is also known as the Golden Temple. The fifth guru, Arjan, designed the Golden Temple, and he was the person responsible for collecting the teachings of the gurus into a sacred book, which is the Guru Granth Sahib. The Sikhs also have five seats of authority known as talks, which literally means a throne or seat of authority. There are five gudwaras that have special significance for the Sikh community as well. The first and the most important one is the Akal Tak, which literally translates into the throne of a timeless god. And it's situated directly across from the Golden Temple. All right, so the Guru Grot number 10 is Guru Nanak Dev. Guru Nanak Dev was the first of the 10 gurus, and he founded the Sikh faith and introduced the concept of one god. Guru Nanak Dev was born in Nankana Sahib, Pakistan on October 20th, 1469. Now, he was a son of Kailan Das Ji, also known as Meta Kali Ji and Meta Tripta Ji. He was married and had two sons, and he was formally made guru in 1499 at around the age 30 years old. And at the age of 69 years old, he lost his life in the year of 1539. And by the way, for this video, some of the locations are the current names, but this, of course, was actually before the time of the Pakistan and Indian partition. Now that that's cleared up, let's move on to number nine. We have Guru Angad Dev. Guru Angad Dev compiled writings of Nanak Dev and introduced what is known as the Gurmurki script. Now, this second guru was born in India on March 31st in the year 1504, and he became guru on September 7th, 1539. He was the son of Feru Malji and Mata Daya Karuji, and he was married to Mata Kiviji, and together they had several children, two sons, and two daughters. Guru Anga Dev's life ended in Kadar, India on March 29th, 1552. Guru number eight is Guru Amar Das. He is the third in the line of 10 gurus, and he was someone who rejected the caste system, and he made efforts to create a more inclusive society, even for homeless people. He became the third guru on March 26, 1552, and he lived a very long life, but unfortunately, that came to an end on September 1st, 1574, at the age of 95 years old. He was born May 5th, 1479. This guru got married to a woman by the name of Mansa Devi and had two sons and two daughters named Mohan, Mori, Dani, and Bani. Moving on to the guru at number seven, here we have Guru Ram Das. He became the fourth guru on September 1st, 1574. And Guru Ram Das was the one who began the excavation of the Sarovar, which is the sacred pool in Sikhism, and that's located in Amritsar, India. He was born in Chunamandi, which is now known as Lahore, Pakistan, on September 24th, 1524. And his parents were Hari Das Ji Sodi and Mata Daya Kar Ji. He married Bibi Bani Ji, and they had three sons together, and this guru lived up until the age of 46 years old. Guru Arjun Dev is up next. He's the fifth guru, and Guru Arjun Dev is the guru who headed the building of the Golden Temple, and it's located in Amritsar, India. And he also compiled and contributed to the Adi Granth in 1604. And by the way, the Adi Granth in the Punjabi language means first book, and it is a sacred scripture in Sikhism. He was born on April 14, 1563, and he got married to Ram Devi, but they didn't have any children together. He also married a woman named Ganga Ji, and they had a child together, and his name was Har Govind, and this son also became a guru. He was made the fifth guru on September 1st, 1581, and he died in Lahore, Pakistan on May 30th, 1606, at the age of 43 years old. Halfway into number five, we have Guru Har Govind. He built the Akal Takht, which is one of the five seats of power of Sikhs, located inside the Golden Temple. And now he raised an army and carried two swords that symbolized worldly and spiritual authority. Also, the Mughal Emperor Jahangir, he imprisoned this guru who negotiated a release for him for whoever could hold on to his robe. 
He married three women and he was a father of five sons and one daughter. He was pronounced a Sikh Sikh at Amritsar, India on May 25th, 1606. From there, we move on to Guru Har Rai. This is the seventh of the 10 gurus who worked really, really hard to solidify the Sikh faith. This guy, he was a very dedicated man who had 20,000 personal guards, and he also established a hospital and a zoo. He was born in India on January 16th, 1630, and he had two sons and one daughter. One of his sons actually became the next guru. He was named the seventh guru on March 3rd, 1644, and he lost his life on October 6, 1661, at the age of 31 years old. The guru at number three is Guru Har Krishan. Now, this guru became a guru at the age of just five years old. He was born on July 7th, 1656, and he was the son of Guru Har Rai. He became guru on October 6, 1661, at a very, very young age, clearly, but it was very short lived because he ended up losing his life due to smallpox in the year 1664 at the age of seven. His title as guru was the shortest of all the 10 gurus. Now, number two brings us Guru Teg Bahadar. He's the ninth guru in the line of 10 gurus, and initially he was pretty reluctant to become a guru. He became a guru at Baba Bakala, India on August 11th, 1664. And as the story goes, he ultimately sacrificed his life to protect Hindu pandits from forced conversion to Islam at the age of 54 years old. He was born on April 1st, 1621, and he is the son of Guru Har Govind and Mata Nanki Ji. And he married Gudri Ji, and they had one son who's known as Gobind Singh. Yeah, that's actually the 10th guru, Gobind Singh. He's also the creator of the Order of Khalsa, which is the purified and reconstructed Sikh community. He became the 10th Guru on November 11th, 1675, and lost his life on October 7th, 1708, at the age of 41 years old. Guru Gobind Singh, he completed the Granth, or the sacred text, and gave it the title of the Everlasting Guru. Now, you're probably saying to yourself, wait, I thought there were 10 Gurus. Well. 10 human gurus is more accurate. That leads us to our bonus guru in this episode, the Guru Granth Sahib that I mentioned at the beginning. Guru Granth Sahib is actually a text and is Sikhism's holy scripture. It has a title of the last and everlasting guru. Now he, as the text is referred to as, became guru on October 7th, 1708, and still is a guru to this day. All right, so let's start off with the first similarity at number 10, we have the concept of God. Being strictly monotheistic, both of these religions really emphasize on the oneness of God, and they believe that God is the absolute one. He's also all-powerful, all-knowing. In Islam, Allah is the supreme God, and in Sikhism, Waheguru is the divine almighty. Now, in Surah 112 of the Quran, you can see that it says, He is God who is one, God the eternal refuge. He neither begets nor is born, nor is there to him any equivalent. Now, in the English translation of the first passage of the Guru Granth Sahib for Sikhs, it says, There is only oneness, and it's called the truth. It exists in all creation, and it has no fear. It has no hate, and it is timeless, universal, and self-existent you will come to know it through the grace of the Guru. The next similarity is the use of intoxicants. So both Islam and Sikhism, they absolutely forbid the consumption of alcohol and other forms of intoxicants. Now, in the Sikh religion, there's a pretty basic principle behind this, which is to keep the body pure. Now, there's a similar principle in Islam because the Arabic term used for intoxicants is kamar, and that originates from the word kamara, which means to cover. And this sort of implies that this cover and affects the judgment of your mind. So anything that does that, like marijuana, cocaine, heroin, and things like that, are completely prohibited for Muslims. In the Quran Surah 2 verses 219, it says, 
They question thee about strong drink and games of chance. Say in both is a great sin and some utility for me. But the sin of them is greater than their usefulness. Now in the Guru Granth Sahib, page 319, it says, the misguided people who drink wine are the most foolish. Now I've quoted from both of the holy books of these religions, but you know, that's actually a similarity, the belief in a holy book. For the most part, these holy books are a compilation and discussion of central religious texts that center around the beliefs, the ethical conducts, ritual practices of Islam and Sikhism. And both these religions trust the authority of their respected holy scriptures. And they both consider them to be divine revelations. So for Muslims, it's the Holy Quran. And they believe that it was orally revealed by God to the Prophet Muhammad. And for Sikhs, the Adi Granth, which is also known as the Grand Sahib is the holy scripture and it's made up of nearly 6,000 hymns of the Sikh gurus as well as various early medieval saints and sages of different religions and castes and it also has contributions from Muslim Sufis as well. There's also a similarity in both these religions having no priesthood. So there is technically no ordination or any sort of ordained priesthood in Islam and Sikhism according to the religious followers, but the followers can themselves perform certain religious rites as well as recite prayers to the Supreme Almighty. So in Islam, you'll find local spiritual leaders like an Imam, a Mullah, a Mufti. And in Sikhism, you'll find in their Gudwaras, which is a place of worship, someone known as a Granthi. And similar to Islam, this person is not a priest, but they're responsible for reading the Adi Granth, as well as organizing daily religious services. And a priest, however, is sort of like an intermediary between humans and God, but no, you won't find that in any of these religions. Both Sikhism and Islam are very big when it comes to charity. So both religions have given the utmost importance to charity. The term zakat, which means the charity, is the third pillar of Islam. And of course, it's a major teaching of the Prophet Muhammad. And in the Holy Quran, it's been mentioned that being charitable, as well as providing those who are in need, is a very important characteristic and a moral principle of all Muslims. So zakat is a compulsory charity that means that you're obligated to feed the poor and support orphans in various different ways, according to Allah. Now in Sikhism, you'll find that there's a strong belief that giving money to charity as well as assisting people living in poverty and who are experiencing some form of suffering is a religious duty that encourages compassion and is one of the ways that you can serve humanity. So giving is one of the three golden rules of Sikhism. The fundamental teachings of Sikhs are van chakan, which means share what you have and consume it together in a community, which means doing selfless services to other people as well as treating all people with equality. Halfway in at number five, there's a similarity between rewards and punishment. Both these religions have a principle that you reap what you sow. And Islam puts a lot of importance to the life after death as they strongly believe that God will resurrect and judge every individual and give them either reward or punishment based on the deeds that they committed in this life. Now there's sort of a difference between the Muslims and the Sikh views on this because Sikhs don't believe in the afterlife or hell or heaven, but they do believe that good or bad actions determine your reward and your punishment. Now guys, you've heard the terms monasticism and mendicini. To be honest, this was actually my first time hearing these terms. I know, it was pretty crazy. But both these religions look down on the idea of monasticism and mendicini, and they believe in having a family life. And that word there, monasticism, by the way, it means monkhood, like living life as a monk. And now this is normally a religious way of life where one renounces all worldly pursuits in order to devote their life solely to the duties of their faith. But this sort of lifestyle is most commonly found in Catholicism and Orthodox traditions, as well as you can find this in Buddhism, Hinduism, and Jainism. Now in the Quran, Surah 57, verse 27, it says, but monasticism they invented, we ordained it not for them, only seeking Allah's pleasure, and they observed it not with right reverence. Now in the Sikh holy book, the Adi Granth or the Granth Sahib, whichever term you want to use, it says, according to the Guru's teachings, what can be achieved outside the home can also be achieved at home. 
So Nanak has become a renunciate. And that's found on page 992. And also on page 522, it says, seek salvation while you're living a normal life. Ooh. Similarity number three is the place of worship. Now a gudwar is a place of assembly and worship for Sikhs. And Sikhs also refer to gudwaras as gurdwara sahi. And even those who don't even profess any faith are welcome to join the Sikhs in their gudwaras. All gudwaras have a type of hall where people can eat vegetarian food, as well as they may have medical facilities, libraries, nurseries, classrooms, meeting rooms, as well as other facilities inside of their gudwaras. And in Islam, mosques are the place of worship for the Muslims. Mosques commonly serve as a location for prayer, as well as funeral services, Sufi ceremonies, marriages, businesses, a place to collect donations to charity, and more. So both their places of worship also have multiple uses. Ceremony number two, let's talk about head covers. For Sikhs, the turban has traditionally been worn by men, while women cover their heads with a long scarf called a chuni or a dupata. However, many Sikh women have adopted the turban as their head covering as well. And for Muslims, the followers can wear a turban or a fez. They may even grow a beard, but they generally do trim their hair. For Sikhs, they actually don't trim their hair. That's why their hair is so long and they use a turban to just uh, keep it safe so that they're not stepping on it or it's not getting caught into anything. And for women in Islam, they may wear a hijab to cover their heads. So this is why there's quite a bit of confusion when it comes to identifying a Sikh or a Muslim but if you actually learn the different styles of the turban wrapping and the head covering you can easily be able to tell the difference and finally the similarity at number one is five prayers they both have five prayers. So the Nitnam Banis are the five daily prayers of Sikhism. Now Sikhism has established a practice of three morning prayers, then there's an evening prayer, and then there's a bedtime prayer. In Islam, part of the five pillars of Islam is Salat. And Salat refers to the five obligatory prayers. And these prayers are done at dawn, midday, late afternoon, sunset, and nightfall. See you soon.